our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. Please invite several people to join in. And let's open up today's session with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. Yes, Lord. Your love. Mm. Bless the reading of your word. Mm. Cause the hearers mm. to respond to it. Yes, Lord. That they may bear fruits that bring glory to the kingdom. Yes, Reveal Jesus Christ today mm. and him alone crucified mm. as the Lord of all mm. to the praise and glory yes, Lord. in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Today's reading, we'll be taking it from the book of Romans, chapter 3, from verse 27 to verse 31. Let's read. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. All is he the God of the Jews only. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then Make void the law through faith? Certainly not. Neda. On the contrary, we establish the law. From this text, Paul is bringing to us the implication or the outcome of justification. Now we saw last week and the week before that, having been introduced to the subject or the message of justification. And previously, we had seen the message of condemnation. And this we went through at length. Coming all the way from Romans chapter 1, verse 18, up to Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Now we began the message of justification. From Chapter 3, verse 21. And this is where we understood what justification is. We also saw how this justification was secured. And then we saw how this justification is received. So this basic instruction, we learned several things from what justification is all about. And this briefly are the following. Number one, that justification is received apart from the law. Second, we understood that this justification is not a new phenomenon. It's not something that God is reinventing. No, it has been witnessed to by 
the law and the prophets. So the message of justification by faith goes all the way from Genesis. We see that Abraham was justified by faith. So this is not something that is unique to us in the New Testament. This has been God's way of dealing with all men. The third thing we realize is that justification is provided by God. Now, it's, so he is the highest court. So when he decrees you justified, he credits you with his righteousness. And there is no higher court, there is no other person who can add to or remove from what God has done. Now, that is very good news. The, sec the fourth one that we understood is that this justification is to be received by faith. Now, this is amazing because there is no other currency you're using. There is, there is no amount that you are paying. You only have to believe. And faith will then have this righteousness or this justification credited or imputed to you. The, the, the other that we understood from there, which is point number five, is that this justification is required by all. First of all, I need to point out that when it comes to justification, it is God who requires it. But it is God who provides it. Us. So now this is needed by all. Why? Because all of us have sinned. And all of us fall short of the glory of God. So there is none who measures up. And with that understanding, God has set forth all he has declared publicly. So it is not a secret ingredient. This is something God has publicly declared. Because he desires that all men be saved. So when it comes to justification, God has set forth the principle. God has set forth the method through which men may be saved. Then we also oh. understood as the seventh point that this is received as a gift. It is given to us freely. We don't earn it. God bestows it to us free of judge. It is not something we merit. It is not something that we earn. It is something that we receive as a gift from God. Number eight, we understand the basis of us receiving this gift. It is because it was purchased for us by Christ Jesus. So through his death on the cross, through his sinless life, he then becomes our substitute. And through his resurrection, we have the guarantee that we can now 
now receive this justification because Christ has paid for the price and he has paid it in full. The final point that we glean from there is that this is God's design. The Bible tells us that God did this that he may be the just and the justifier of all that come to him by faith. You see, what makes God just is his just treatment of all sin. But that is not the end of the story. He also becomes the justifier of men. And we need to have understood that. Now, then that brings us to verse 27. And here Paul then begins to expound on what the implication of of justification are. So first of all, let's understand what implication means. So implication is a logical consequence that is drawn from something else that is true. So to bring it in practical terms, it is saying that if statement A, B, C are correct, then the logic is that D, E, and F must be true or correct. So, with that logic, we come back to the text. And what Paul is trying to paint here is that from verse 21 to verse 26, here are some truths that he stresses. And therefore, from verse 21 to verse 26, having placed down that truth, then it follows that from verse 27 to 31, these texts statements must be true. So basically what he's trying to expound is the outcome of our justification. And here he lists three implications. The first one is in verse 27 to 28. The second one is from verse 29 to verse 30. And the third implication is found in verse 30. And like a lawyer, he brings this out in a methodical way. So he first asks the question, and then he provides an answer. And after providing the answer, then he goes on to give us an explanation. So first you have the question, then he provides an answer, and then he gives us the explanation. So using Using these three, he is able to give us the three implications of what justification is all about. So let's look at the first implication, which we find in chapter 3, verse 27 to 28. And what we see in this text is asks the question, where is the boasting then. What is he trying to paint here? He's trying to paint to us that all boasting is excluded 
nti okwewa na nokwenyimiriza kona kuba kujidwa wo so the justification that we have by faith kati ogobwa ko musango katwawe babwe twakiriza does not include any way that we can boast tetigatibwa mu ngeri yonna mujju kwenyumiriza so there is nothing that we should be boasting about tetulina chetujanti chino chene nyumiriza so you cannot say i am better than they doso agamba ati the mosingo yo because we all are justified by faith. Kubanga feno tugobwa ko musango olwo kukiriza. So there is no way we can be exalted above others. Ashteli nkola ndale tuyimusa waguru wa balala. So there is no and no way you can be have an attitude because every one of us all of us has have sinned and it is just by the grace of God that we are justified. Endo za taina we itida kubanga fena twayo nonda ne tuwebo obutukiri vo olwo kukiriza mukatonda. And that should bring us to a point of humility. Why? Because you see, boasting is self-exaltation. It is to pridefully brag about something. So you look in the mirror and you love what you see and you exalt what you see in the mirror. But that cannot happen. When we come to Christ by faith, if we are justified by grace, then we can't boast. Because everything that we have acquired has been freely given to us. So rather than boasting, we need to have a lowly attitude bela nendo oze yo muntu omweto oze no self elevation ngatewe sawo self exaltation obo kwestu la yo kusuka yandi komye how then goes on to say paul ayongera it is excluded the chizi yizibwa and the greek word for excluded ekigamba abakuluga cho muliona is the word eklelio now this is a negative word it is like to shut the door it's like when you slam a door and lock it to prevent somebody from gaining access so what is trying to say here is he closing the door of any boasting whatsoever so that you and I have no reason to boast. That door has been shut. And he gives us the explanation. And in providing the explanation, he asks the question, by what kind of law? Of works? Now, the law he is talking about here is not the mosaic law. He is referring to the governing principle. So he's saying by what operative principle is God, God justifying us? Is it works? Was it human effort? That through it God justifies you? Then, then he goes on to give the response. And he says, no. But by a law of faith. So the law of faith is talking about. He is talking, you see, he talked about the law, and now he talks about the law of faith. So the law of works and the law of faith. Basically, he's drawing a comparison between two principles. One of works and the one of faith. And he says, 
by the law of faith here. He's talking about the principle that God will use. Or the principle that God is using to justify sinners. And here, the principle that he uses is salvation not by on a works basis but exclusively by grace through faith. May I put it this way. You see, the reason I believe that we cannot be justified by our works is first of all our works come short of God's standard. And therefore God uses the works of another who is Christ Jesus. So the basis is of someone else's works. And based on those works, which speaks to his sinless life, which speaks to his sacrifice, at the cross. Based on this, then we are justified. So in reality, we are saved by works. But the works of somebody else. And when we place our faith in his finished work, then in the eyes of God, we are then justified. So if you rely on your works, I will refer you to Isaiah 64 6, where he says, All our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. So, what we rely on is the works of Christ. And faith in that then imputes on us what God alone requires and that which only God can provide. So when you understand that, then you, you realize that this is a gift from God. And you cannot boast about it. In another portion of scripture, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2, Verse 7. Paul asks this question. For he says, For who regards you as superior? And he asks them, What do you have that you did not receive? She goes on to say, And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You see, today we are living in an era where certain people think they are so way above others. But the question I need to ask you what is it that you have? that you have not been given. You see, there is nothing good in our lives except that which we have received freely from God. The one that James paints it so well when he says every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven from the Father of Light in whom there is no shadow of time you see, God was at work. Even when it comes to salvation or saving faith. Even the faith we are talking about is a gift from God. So everything that you have is God providing. He provides 
the solution which is Christ Jesus yes. then he provides the faith then he provides the Holy Spirit then he provides the messenger and then he provides the message so everything that you have as far as salvation and redemption is concerned you have because God has provided not as a result of works. That's why he goes again to Ephesians 2 and 9 to emphasize lest anyone should boast. So the whole package of salvation not only just redemption at the cross, but all the way through repentance and faith, all this is a gift from God. And so when we have that, then we need to have that lowly mindset. And the, the action I want to draw is the example we draw from John the Baptist. In John chapter 3, when John's ministry was at a peak, his disciples observed something. That Jesus Christ on the other side of the Jordan was attracting more disciples. Much more than what John had. So they come to John and explain to him. And they tell him there is somebody out there who is drawing more crowds than you are. He's actually getting more disciples than you're actually getting. But listen to John's response. 327. He says, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Let me speak to you, minister of God. Even the ministry that you have is a gift from God. Even the fruit of your ministry is a gift from God. So you cannot even boast in the ministry. So that by the way, there is, there is nothing to boast about. Rather, this should be a call to us to humble ourselves before God. Why is that important? Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. He says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. So the best position for you to be, the best position for you and I to be, to be recipients of God's grace, is the position of humility. So, Having exhausted that, we move on to the second implication. So we've seen the first implication. Is that no one can boast. So boasting is excluded. The second implication is what we see in verse 29 to verse 30. And this points to the removal of all distinctions. It moves all the classes. It, it moves all the classifications. It removes all kind of hierarchy. So if justification by faith 
alone is true. Then they cannot be in the classes. We, we cannot have levels of believers. Why? Because we are all equally justified by faith. No one is more justified than another. So we are all imputed with the same righteousness of Jesus Christ. And there is no distinction. Because all we have done is place our faith in him. So that's why the Bible tells us when John says, as many as received him. To them he gave the power to become the sons of God or the children of God. To them he gave the exousia, the power to become children of God. So God does not have stepchildren. He does not have grandchildren. God has children. So there are no distinctions. And Paul here brings the question. Paul is all is God the God of the Jews only? What is he trying to say? Is God saving only the Jews? Or is God only justifying the Jews? And in 29, the second part he says, Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? And the answer to that, yes, he is the God of the Gentiles. You see, the Jews and the Gentiles are both justified. The Jews are justified the same way the Gentiles are justified. So what is trying to demonstrate here is that there is no distinction. The same way the Jews are justified, which is through faith, is the same way the Gentile is justified, which is through faith. The same gospel message that brings salvation to the Jew is the same gospel message that brings justification to the Gentile. Now, Jews refer to those who have the law. The Gentile refers to everybody else who is not Jews. So, what is trying to say here is that all of us from the very beginning of time receive our justification by faith. But you see what was happening? That from the very beginning, what we see are people holding the gospel to themselves. Thinking that they have a monopoly of God. Now, some think this is a New Testament phenomenon. It is not. It goes all the way to the Old Testament. This is what happened to a certain prophet called Jonah. He was sent to the city of Nineveh. He gets into a boat and goes to Tarshish. Which I would see like God is sending you to Kabong. And you get on the bus and go to Kabari. So you're going to the other extreme, far away from where God is calling you. And what we see out of that story, that he met misfortune along the way and he finally was taken back to Nineveh. 
ya firwa binji pakire ya mariza atwali dwe nineve and when he preached the message bwe abulira obubaka the people repented about nevene nya look at that when he preached the message chetegereze bwe abulira obaya atwali obubaka the people repented about nevene nya and god forgave them katunda naba sunyu justified an entire city by faith ya gobo musango kuchivuga chona olwo kukiriza and then jonah oh. was seated under the tree pouting hey, la, complaining la, la, because god had justified the people by faith yona na atula wansi wo muti ne ntondo nokwe mulugunya kuba katonda yali abagobyeko omusango ebakiriza he say the heart of god is with the world oh, oh, with all humanity omutima gwa katonda guli eri abantu bonna he does not want any to be any of them to perish. So Paul here then back to the text goes back to us. Paulo has having given us the question. Given us the answer. Now he comes to the explanation. Of why there is no distinction. In verse 30 he says. Since indeed God will just justify the circumcised by faith obanga chadala katonda aliko bo musango kumukomole olwo kukiriza and the uncircumcised through faith naba taliba komole olwo kukiriza so there is no way teri yo nkola ndala you to be saved omujudayo kulokoka other than faith and there is no way for the Gentile to be saved other than faith in Jesus Christ. So both of them are justified through faith. And he says, since indeed God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, is one obanga katonda yomu yali gobo musango kuba komole era na gobo musango kuba tali bakomole he brings a very important aspect to this i know ngeli ja chileta nga chikuru he says by one nagamba olwomu so what is trying to say chageza ko is that they are not two gods the dreamer bakatonda babidi one god katonda aliyomu is justifying the jews ya gobo musango kuba yuda and he is the same god yomu katonda is justifying the gentiles ya gobo musango kuba mawanga basically he's restating what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 adamu chetula mwe chama take cho kubile sura ya where God declares that here O Israel the Lord is our God the Lord is one so what Paul is trying to stress here in the book Paulo chanyweza mu kitabo kino is that there is only one god katonda aliyo muyeka so there is also not only one god but there is only one way tali katonda muyeka nene kube liliwo limuliyoka one way of justifying sinners liye kubo liye limu eligo bwako abantu abono nye musango and this god is not divided in himself katonda ono taye ya wudde muye no it is not that god the father is justifying the Jews and then God the Son is justifying the Gentiles no sinti katonda chitafi agobo musango kuba yudaya omwana katonda na agobo musango kuba mawanga no Nedda. god is one katonda aliyo no wonder jesus comes back to john 10:30 Yesu ngayogera mu yokana kubyo nyiriro rasatu and says i and the father are one dinze nechitange tuliyo so they are unity they are not divided they are not split temulinja ukana and having understood that paul comes to the book of timothy and tells us ne mungeliye mu paulo ngayo andikira timothy wa yogera in first timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 timothy we chisoka bilion nyiriro akutano he says for there is one god waliyo katondo mu there is one god waliyo katondo mu and one mediator no mutabaganya omu not two not three one bili omu mediator between god and men atabaganya abantu ne katonda so when it comes to matters of god 
than men. There is only one mediator. And that mediator is the man, Jesus Christ. This affirms what Jesus stated in John 14, 6. And he says, I am the way. So there is only one way between God and men, Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the only solution. There is no other way of salvation. So what does that imply? Him being the way, him being the only mediator, then that places all of us in one group which is the body of Christ. And there is no distinction. Why? Because the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 14 to 16 that at the cross of Calvary Jesus tore down the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. So all of us now become the body of Christ. So there is nothing like the Jewish body of Christ and then the Gentile body of Christ. No, that there is nothing like for you, you are Methodist, for you are Presbyterian, for you are Baptist, for you are Miracle Center, for you are Dominion. No! We are all the body of Jesus Christ. There is only one body. And this is the body of those justified by faith in one, Jesus Christ. So there is no division whatsoever. And that needs to register at the back of everyone's mind that all of us are justified and there is no distinction. In the eyes of God, we are all the body of Jesus Christ. Which brings us to the third implication. The first one we observed is that there is no boasting. The second one is that there is no distinction whatsoever. Now we come to the third one. And Paul asserts that the law is established. Look at what he says. He asks the question, do we nullify the law through faith? In other words, if we are justified apart from the law, is the law now nullified? Is the law now of no effect? Is the law now useless? Does the law now not serve any purpose? So he asks, do we then nullify the law? And that word nullify is the negative word katajeo. In other words, to make of no effect. Or to cause, to seize. And here he is talking, referring to the moral law. And he provides the answer. And says, certainly not. Certainly not. The Greek word there is megenoito. He's saying absolutely not. He is not saying no. He is basically saying no a thousand times. No. Oh, saying no, not now, not ever. And then he goes on to give us the justification now, or the explanation. He says, on the contrary, we establish the law. 
Now this is a totally opposite thinking to that which many people have that justification nullifies the law. No, justification establishes the law. Establish <laughs> means <laughs> is the Greek word histemi. <laughs> which is to cause something to stand or to cause someone to stand. So justification does not nullify the law. Justification establishes the law. Now, you noticed in this text the use of the law in four instances. And I want us to look at each of them so that we draw distinctions. One of them is in verse 19, where we see the Lord referring to the entire Old Testament. Then in verse 21, he talks about the law. And he adds, and the prophets. So what is talking, referring to the law in verse 21? He is actually speaking to the first five books of the Old Testament. That's why he says the law and the prophets. Whereas in verse 19 he says the law. Referring to the entire Old Testament. The, sec the third use that we see is what we see in verse 27 to 28. Where he refers to the law, he is talking about the operating principle. And then finally is the law that we are referring to in verse 31. Where he is referring to the moral law. And which all of us have sinned. So we need to understand and be able to differentiate what is actually in context here. Otherwise, we will misinterpret the entire text. Now you're going to ask me now how about the ceremonial law? And how about the civil law? The civil law applied to Israel and how they needed to be governed. The moral law on the other hand was separate from the civil law which is separate from the ceremonial law. The ceremonial laws dealt with worship. And all these pointed to Christ. So in his death and resurrection, all these laws were taken care of. But when it comes to the moral law, there are aspects of it that still apply. We are still to have no other gods before him. <laughs> that applies to us. We oh, are still not to take his name in vain. So we are still to take his name to take his name in vain. We are still to take his name in still to honor our fathers and mothers. We are still not to bow down or to worship any graven image. We should not be murdering. We should not be committing adultery. We should not steal. We should not bear fault witness. We should not covet. So what is the implication? 
We are still obligated by faith to obey the moral commands of God. And what's amazing, that is why we have the Holy Spirit given to us as a gift. Who is the, our moral compass to help us, to aid us, to align us to what God's will is for our lives and how we ought to conduct our lives. So justification is not a free pass for us to do what we want, how we want, when we want. No, 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 no. Justification does not mean you have the liberty to do whatever comes to your mind. Uh -uh. Justification means through faith you God has justified you. Unless you look at two more scriptures. In Romans chapter 7 verse 12. This is what Paul writes. He says the law is holy. And the commandment is holy. And righteous. And good. And in verse 14 of Romans chapter 7, he goes on to say, For we know that the law is spiritual. So that with that understanding, we come back to re-emphasize the three implications of being justified by faith. And number one, we say that we have no reason to boast. And secondly, we saw that because we have been justified by faith, there is no dis distinction. There are no classes. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And thirdly, we note that the law will still be there. We will fall into the moral law of God. Why? Because justification does not remove it. Justification establishes it. Because God is just. And there has to be a basis for God to judge. And then God is the justifier. And he justifies you and I through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you are watching us, you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. You don't know him as your Lord and Savior. Today, you can surrender your life to him. He will come in your life, save you, and then grant you his righteousness. And the implications of justification then become your portion. Why don't you say this prayer with me? Say, God in heaven, I thank you because you are just God and you are the justifier of all those that come to you through faith in Jesus Christ. I am a sinner, Lord. I need a savior in my life. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God who died and rose for my sake. Today I believe and receive everything that he died for me to receive. I laid down everything at the cross and embraced the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work. Spirit of the living God, come live in me and help me to live this life holy 
Even as the Father is holy. Lord, I thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you made that prayer from the bottom of your heart, you have been wonderfully saved. That's the good news of the gospel. Please call that number on the screen. Somebody will pick up and guide you on the first steps in this new day. It is going to be a wonderful journey, I promise you. Now for all of us that have Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we need to take this message to the ends of the world. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all nations as a witness. Then the end shall come. Let's take this message of the gospel. That God justifies all men by faith in the man Jesus Christ and his finished work. God richly bless you as you take that message to the ends of the from Dominion Church we say shalom till we meet again